name, this conference will now Mark be Meister, recorded. The executive director of the Museum of Russian Art. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's discussion of the new book, Alexander Solzhenitsyn and American Culture, The Russian Soul in the West. It is by David P. Diebel and Jessica Houghton Wilson. This program was organized by the Russian American Business and Culture Council and sponsored by the Museum of Russian Art. We're fortunate tonight to have Jessica Houghton Wilson and David P. Diebel, along with Matthew Lee Miller, participating. So to get started, we'll kick it off with Jessica. Jessica Houghton Wilson is the Louise Cohen Scholar in Residence at the University of Dallas. She's the author of three books, Giving the Devil His Due, Flannery O'Connor and Fyodor Dostoevsky, Walker Percy, Fodor Dostoevsky and the Search for Influence, and reading Walker Percy's novels. In 2019, she received the High Prize for Humanity from the Dallas Institute of Humanities and Culture. So, Jessica. Thank you. I had my mic muted. I'm sorry. It would actually help me if everyone except for me muted their mics because I think it'll cut down on the sound. We're getting a little bit of back sound. Uh, and I've asked Lucian if he could share his screen so that we could walk through a PowerPoint so you don't just have to look at me. You actually get to see some, some pictures. Here we go. So this first picture that you're seeing is actually on one of my bookshelves. And it's kind of a strange thing maybe to start with, um, to start with a picture of a mug. <laughs> but on the mug, if you look closely, and I it's around, so I know it's a strange angle, but on my right, so as you're looking at the mug to the left, is Natalia Dmitrievna Solzhenitsyn. And on my left in the picture, but as our right, as we're looking at, is Ed Erickson, who we dedicated the book to, and actually is the impetus for why we put the book together in the first place. And then, of course, behind it is the centenarian, uh, the centenary uh, collection of essays that was published in Solzhenitsyn's honor. And so I have these things on my desk. Where I am standing with Erickson and Natalia Dmitrievna Solzhenitsyn is in the apartment where Solzhenitsyn was rested. And I first got to know Solzhenitsyn actually through the family. He was not an author that I was familiar with, but Edward Erickson was a friend of mine and we had an interest in Russian literature. Actually, both of us read quite a bit of Bogolkov and Dostoevsky and he introduced me to Solzhenitsyn. And so I was able to go over there and meet them. And as soon as I did and began reading Solzhenitsyn, I thought, why has no one ever taught me Solzhenitsyn? I was a literature scholar. This was what I wanted to do was to study Russian literature and he was not a name that came up. And so as I've spent the last several years just trying to get to know him and trying to figure out why it is that he is kind of the unsung hero of 20th century Russian literature, but also perhaps a voice of prophecy for American culture as well. Uh, thus this book was came into being um, between David and I, and hopefully he'll talk about this as well in his in his paper tonight. So I want to start with why I think that he's been so ignored. So Lucien, if you can move to the next slide. Um, really, one of the problems has been that Solzhenitsyn has been considered a political writer and not really acknowledged for his aesthetic merits. When people write on Solzhenitsyn, they write on him historically, they write on him politically, but they don't look at his literature as a literary writer. And so that's one of the gaps that I tried to fill in. Why is it that we haven't talked about Solzhenitsyn as a literary writer? What is it that we need to pay attention to? And I think In the First Circle is one of those books that if we look more closely, we get to see a lot of what's going on there aesthetically. The book itself is probably one of my favorite Solzhenitsyn's writings. If you have not read Solzhenitsyn before, I wouldn't recommend you throw yourself into The First Circle because it is rather large. Most people get to know him with One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich, which I think David is talking about tonight. And that's probably the most common source because it's rather small, <laughs> whereas a lot of Solzhenitsyn's works are mammoth texts. And this one is, but it's worth it. Uh, the title itself actually comes from Dante. And so I'm going to recommend that if we read it in conversation with the tradition, if we read it by looking at Dante and even Dostoevsky and some of these literary heroes for Solzhenitsyn, we will get a different angle or a different understanding of the book than maybe if we just read it as a political text. 
So Lucy, and if you can move to the next slide. So let me tell you a little bit about in the first circle. In the first circle refers to the first circle of hell in Dante's Inferno. So when Dante enters, the pilgrim is actually enthusiastic about entering hell because he sees all of this company of elite, right? Homer, Socrates, Ptolemy, and they're all reclining in this verdant field discussing lofty ideas. So the scene is seductive, um, so much so that I think even the reader forgets that they're actually in hell. <laughs> but only after Dante has journeyed to the darkest regions of hell does he come to realize that even those that are in limbo are in the forsaken circle. Uh, the darkest regions doesn't take away the fact that this early region is, is it's a lie, it's a deception. And I think that that's where Solzhenitsyn is drawing his title from, is this idea that this is actually the most seductive region of hell because you forget it's hell. And those who are there in the first circle have forgotten the point of the good. It is this abject state, it's the guise of liberty that Solzhenitsyn found when he himself was in the highest circle, when he was actually um, in this Sharashka or scientific institute within the Gulag that didn't seem as bad as some of the rest of the camps. So Solzhenitsyn experienced this firsthand. In some sense, then it is a little bit autobiographical. Um, those who are in the Sharashka right, are those who are anti-communist thinkers. And Solzhenitsyn was there from 1946 to 1950. He served with the other scientists and academics, and it was actually called Marfino. It was a prison that was right outside of Moscow. And there they enjoyed limited freedom. They had better food than the labor camps, and they actually could pursue intellectual enterprises, but really for the sake of the party. Um, when one of the prisoners is transferred to a labor camp, he informs the fellow travelers, we're going back to hell. The special prison is the highest, the best, the first circle. It's practically a paradise. As in Dante, then, we see the circle stands on the edge of the abyss. The descent is easy, frequent, and almost inevitable. So Solzhenitsyn is trying to tell us how to read this circle, uh, that we can understand everything spiraling downwards for all of these characters. Solzhenitsyn was not able to publish this right away. He had to actually sneak it out and get it published um, and then was able to publish some of it later. Uh, both, both writers, both Dante and Solzhenitsyn were in exile when they were writing and yet they're using that time as a way separate from their homes to unveil the truth about the places that they came from. And I think in the same way that we read Dante's work, not just as a political poem, but also as a love poem, and I would argue even more as a love poem than a political poem, I think we should also be reading in the first circle more as a love poem from Solzhenitsyn than as just a political poem. As Solzhenitsyn puts it in another address, the Lichtenstein address in 1993, he says, true progress is the sum of spiritual progresses of individuals. And just as Dante begins the story by saying, this is our journey, so too Solzhenitsyn is trying to include us in this journey that his characters undertake in the story. For him, it is not a matter of being a political treatise. This is not just journalism. It's not just good for one political moment. This is a story that even though it was written in the 1950s, still has value and universal good even now in the 21st century. So 1979, uh, theologian Martin Marty actually explained that Americans must read Solzhenitsyn in this prophetic way as trying to find the universal good that is there in his work. And he says, like all prophets, Solzhenitsyn wants his blazing vision to be taken seriously as a whole. Solzhenitsyn is one of the geniuses, what Marty calls a universal human being. And he says that he's so deeply invested in his own tradition that he's reached to the core of human things. Thus, figures like Dante, Dostoevsky, and now Solzhenitsyn help understand us and judge us um, from within the human race. You can go ahead and, and turn the next slide, Lucian, for me. So what does this book tell us? What are kind of the universal truths in this book? Well, for Solzhenitsyn, one of the biggest problems, one of the things that he thought brought communism to the forefront in his culture was the fact that people easily took on lies that they allowed lies to happen, they participated in lies. Um, a lot of people even, I think today, they're not gonna stand up against lies. Even small little indiscrepancies, lies look like they're not that big of a problem. 
And Solzhenitsyn points out lies are actually one of the biggest problems, <laughs> that by participating in lies, as Dostoevsky tells us, um, you come to the point where you can't distinguish the truth from the lie. And by doing so, then you eventually lose all respect for yourself and other people, and you lose the ability to love. So when I say that this is a love poem, that's what I mean. It's a poem that's trying to restore our very humanity to ourselves by not giving in to the lies around us. And one of the lies that Solzhenitsyn thought most problematic was the lies actually against Russian literature, because Russian literature, like Dante's poems, was actually giving freedom to the individual to hear voices outside of the monolithic narrative of the Soviet regime. So Lucien, if you can change to the next, actually, if you can go two more slides forward. So not just this slide, but two more, one more, I think. Yeah, the danger for Russian writers. Um, the problem with Russian literature, no, go back to the other one, the Russian writers, thanks, thank you. Um, the Russian writers like Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, um, Pushkin, all of these Russian writers were really focused on the human condition and what it meant to be a person. And this is what the Soviet regime did not want. It's hard to control people who have desires and longings and uh, see themselves as souls. And most of Russian literature is getting people in touch with that nature and themselves. Instead, the Soviet regime is most happy when it's able to convince people that they just need to be entertained and fed. And as long as they satisfied those basis, basic desires and keep people only wanting those things, they were able to, to control the most amount of people. And for Solzhenitsyn, he thought literature got you in touch with that truth about yourself that you were made for something much more. And so you see in the book, even an undergraduate who is trying to study literature and she's depressed about the study of literature because they've completely sanitized literature away from anything that puts students in touch with suffering, with death, with problems that would really get them in touch with, with what they are as human beings. And instead, she just read literature. It was all rose-colored literature. Um, that's how they controlled the narrative as much as possible. And so Solzhenitsyn is trying to not control the narrative. He's trying to actually open it up to many different voices and engage in what Dostoevsky's um, literary critic Bakhtin would call polyphony, the many voices, putting people into conversation. So I wanna look at one of the ways that we have one voice and then conclude with this possibility for many voices. Lucien, if you can move to the next slide, we're gonna see this great picture of Stalin. So Stalin is someone that is included in the first circle and you wouldn't expect that because here is a narrative from someone who suffered within the camps. How could he possibly write from the perspective of Stalin? And that's what's amazing about this novel is in the same way that Solzhenitsyn did not appreciate being silenced by Stalin, he's not going to silence Stalin. And I think this he learned this from Dostoevsky and from Dante. In Dante, the sinners get free reign to speak. They all have a chance to say their piece in hell. In Dostoevsky, the Grand Inquisitor can talk himself to death. Ivan Karamazov is not silenced. The other side that is disagreed with is never hushed up or pushed under the rug. In the same way, Stalin is given full voice and character. He's not a caricature. He's not villainized. Um, he's seen the way that Solzhenitsyn thought he would be. And uh, though he, I mean, I think there's some indicting <laughs> language that anyone who's a more discerning reader, you're not going to appreciate Stalin, you're not gonna become friends with him in the narrative. Um, but at the same time, he's allowed to be a full person who has doubts, who has loneliness, who has worries about faith and worries about holding on to his power. Um, this is one example in which Solzhenitsyn is showing the freedom of individuals to be able to speak, to be able to dialogue and not to be hushed up by the regime. Can you turn to the next slide? So just two more things that I wanna close with. One, um, Solzhenitsyn really is getting this idea from the literature that he respected. And of course, Dostoevsky was a huge influence on him. They both suffered through the camps. They both used their experience of suffering to turn into redemptive literature. And um, one of the ideas that he takes from Dostoevsky is this idea that we are subjects when we are able to live in dialogue with one another and that that's where true freedom comes from. 
And so if you get a chance to read Rowan Williams, or if you read my piece that is in um, the book that just came out, The Social Needs in American Culture, I go into this a lot more about what it looks like and why it is that Williams is able to apply this theological perspective to In the First Circle. So let me close with actually the closing of In the First Circle. So Lucien, if you can go to the last slide. The novel, oh, one more, sorry. The novel ends with a warning to the West. And then you have this little picture of a Russian truck there, but it's of course a play truck. Um, but it's the only blue and orange Russian truck that I could find. <laughs> so you're getting that. Um, but the novel ends with this indictment of the West. The last perspective that we see is from a Moscow correspondent who's on his way to a hockey match and he observes this meat truck passing by. And so he jots down a little note in his journalism notebook and it says, every now and then one encounters on the streets of Moscow, food delivery trucks, spick and span and impeccably hygienic. I think I just made him British, I didn't mean to. There can no, be no doubt that the capital's food supplies are extremely well organized. And what the correspondent doesn't realize is that this gaily painted orange and blue truck, as Solzhenitsyn describes it, is actually a prisoner transport truck. And it is taking the Zex from the first circle of hell down into the lower descent of hell. And I think that's what Solzhenitsyn is trying to show us, is that if we're not careful, we're going to only see what we want to see, and we're going to only hear what we want to hear. And instead, Solzhenitsyn is going to unveil this and say that we need to encounter the truth and not just be satisfied with the lies. Thank you. Mark, I think you're muted right now. Sorry. All right, I think I'm up. Uh, really glad to be with you all. Uh, Dave Deevil from the University of St. Thomas. I'm Jessica's co-editor on this volume, Social Needs in an American Culture. Uh, she mentioned Edward Erickson, the, uh, the great Social Needs and Scholar, uh, whom we dedicate this book to and who was the inspiration for it. He was also my, my teacher as an undergraduate at Calvin College uh, about 25 years ago. And so it's a great pleasure to be dedicating this to him. He taught me Dostoevsky and, of course, introduced me to Solzhenitsyn as well. Um, one of the things that we thought about when, when Jessica and I decided that we wanted to uh, dedicate a book to him and, and provide something that would honor uh, Ed Erickson was that we thought about him as taking knowledge and wisdom from the great Russian tradition, from Solzhenitsyn and Dostoevsky and all of these others, and how uh, he wanted that wisdom, but he also was a great American as well, somebody who loved his country and wanted it to, to thrive. And so that's part of the idea behind this entire book is what can we learn uh, from Russia, uh, from the great tradition? Uh, so many great thinkers uh, who weren't even Russian would say things about the fact that they thought that their own nationality was perhaps something, but also Russian literature. Uh, and there's there's some truth in that. Uh, there's so many great things to learn. Right now, of course, uh, there are many questions about about how to think about our own political realities and to think about our own cultural realities. And my essay in the book is uh, dedicated to that question of what Solzhenitsyn thought about America. Thankfully, there are a number of great resources for anybody who wants to to read about what Solzhenitsyn thought about America. Uh, a number of people often ask me, well, what would you recommend that people start with with Solzhenitsyn? And I think Jessica mentioned One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich, uh, and that is a great place to start. I think for one who, who has already read that, uh, the next place to start is the Solzhenitsyn Reader, which was edited and compiled and introduced by Ed Erickson and Daniel J. Mahoney, and it's published by ISI Press. It has selections from many of the great speeches, as well as selections from In the First Circle and many of the other uh, great longer works. Uh, right now, we live in a golden age of uh, social needs and studies, I guess. 
uh, because just after our book came out from the University of Notre Dame Press, the second volume of Solzhenitsyn's uh, memoirs of his time in exile here in America came out, Between Two Millstones, Volume 2. I have not read that one yet, uh, but uh, if you'd like to start in on that, a good place uh, to go is Between Two Millstones, Volume 1, in which he talks about uh, his arrival and some of those first years in which he was going around speaking. Uh, my, my own chapter in the book is about many of the things that he said in those speeches that he gave for groups like the AFL-CIO, and of course the famous Harvard Address, A World Split Apart in 1978, and many others. Solzhenitsyn was uh, not a Slavophile who hated the West. Uh, that's a kind of myth that many people have come to, uh, that he really hated the West and thought it was useless. <laughs> Instead, if you read many of his speeches and in many of his memoirs, you'll learn that Solzhenitsyn was a great admirer of the West, uh, not only of our founding fathers, he thought that, that they were actually uh, wonderful purveyors of the great tradition of understanding the human being as someone who is endowed with liberty and talent under God, not just sort of given to them uh, to do whatever they want. He was also a great admirer of American culture. In some of his speeches that were given in the 1970s after he arrived, he would say things about the fact that we worshiped the West when we were young, we worshiped Americans. And he admitted that uh, you know, America gets a bad rap sometimes. Uh, that if you actually look at who is giving to the world charitably, he said it's America. Many of the things that he said uh, would probably be considered uh, a little too, uh, well, you know, a little too uh, jingoistic uh, for our taste. But he thought that America had a great legacy. He was a little bit bitter about the fact that we had as a political nation, abandoned the East in a way after World War II. Um, although one can think well of uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Winston Churchill, uh, Solzhenitsyn uh, had a little bit of a grudge against them for allowing so much of Eastern Europe to be behind the Iron Cur Curtain. But nonetheless, he did love the West and what he wanted for the West and for particularly for America was that it be revived. Um, one way of thinking about what he saw that was good here and that needed to be revived is to, to think about his admiration for the, uh, the original ideals of America. They're often uh, summarized in that great phrase, uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And of course, Solzhenitsyn thought that all three of those were of interest. But I think one way of thinking about uh, his view is to, to see that his critique implied that we've kind of reversed them. And we've put the pursuit of happiness first, and then liberty, and then life. And in reversing those categories, what we've done is actually uh, negated them. We can start with happiness. Uh, Solzhenitsyn uh, it was very fond of saying that well, you know, happiness really isn't the goal of things. So, you know, you might think he was completely against that notion of a pursuit of happiness, uh, but he wasn't exactly. I think that he thought uh, the happiness that was being pursued in the West had a problem, and that was that it was a happiness conceived purely in material and technological terms. And he said, well, you've reached that already. Uh, in America, you can have pretty much anything that you want at any time you want. Uh, but what's the problem with that notion of happiness? Well, it's actually the same sort of material happiness that was at least promised uh, by those who were running the gulags. And he would often ruefully observe that one of the gulags, the Solovki gulag, bore on its uh, doors as you entered, uh, you know, come, we will drive you to happiness. I don't know if you feel like being driven to happiness, but he thought that this was one of the great lies. And even if in the West with our, our capitalist system, we have been able to produce many great things uh, in terms of those consumer goods, it's not necessarily produced the kind of deep happiness that he thought was necessary, the kind of happiness that he associated with spiritual growth. Solzhenitsyn thought that that uh, surfeit of goods was something that 
did a couple of things. One, it took away our courage. Uh, those who are who are fat and happy, so to speak, are not necessarily going to be willing to risk risk those uh, those goods that they've had, that comfort that they have, uh, for others. They may not even be willing to to risk it for themselves. Uh, Solzhenitsyn gave a very uh, long interview in the in the London Times in 1983 to the interviewer Bernard Levin. And Levin asked him, he said, said, well, you know, you seem to be saying that there are many people who would be willing to, uh, to give up their liberty, uh, you know, simply to keep their goods. And Solzhenitsyn said, yes, actually I do. Uh, I see them all the time since I've, since I've come to the West. Happiness takes away that, that desire to defend one's liberty. Um, happiness in that narrow uh, technical and material sense also takes away our, our own contentment. Uh, it takes away the sense of well-being that we so associate with happiness. Um, he is diagnosing, I think, uh, that thing that we might now call consumerism, that being stuffed to the gills with so many goods that we cannot see the good, capital G, uh, in our own lives. Putting happiness in that narrow sense first is a big mistake, he thought. And it goes along then with that abandonment of liberty, as I said before. Solzhenitsyn thought that it was odd that, 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 there, that liberty had so many enemies. Uh, and one of them is, of course, the notion of equality that we have. It's not that Solzhenitsyn was against political equality under the law, but he saw that an emphasis on everyone being absolutely equal could be very dangerous. He observed that that was the problem with the French Revolution. They put, you know, liberté, égalité, and fraternité. He said, fraternity, he said, you're not going to be able to get that out of, out of, out of political uh, means. Uh, but the real problem is, is that equality, or égalité, is not something that goes well with liberty because people are naturally unequal in many ways. He saw other enemies to, to liberty as well. He saw that there was a kind of raw legalism that people had. Anything that is legal is something that I can do. He saw that there was the enemy of a notion of liberty as simply the right and self-will to do what one wants, apart from the concept of duty. And he saw that liberty as a, a kind of aimless grasping of desires was something that ultimately left people unstable. Uh, Chesterton once said that the great gift of an open mind is only really received when one has something to close it upon. Liberty is a little bit like that as well. Freedom to do anything I want is only going to be good so long as we actually make that choice to act in freedom and act towards the good. And that requires us to, to look at something a little bit deeper. Uh, Solzhenitsyn was very keen on us understanding that true liberty has an endpoint. And that endpoint is not simply doing what I want, but as he said, that endpoint is heroism. We've forgotten the means of, of our own uh, fulfillment. They don't lie in simply material progress or technological progress. And, and those means don't simply lie in acting any way we feel. They lie in acting toward the good. The third thing that he talked about then was life itself. And Solzhenitsyn thought that one of the dangers of a pursuit of happiness and a pursuit of liberty that were independent of the notions of good and evil and the notions of the depth of soul and the notions of heroism is that we would eventually give up on life. Um, he was he was convinced that in order to pursue these things, we had to have a real conception of what is at the deepest heart of the human being. And for those of you who have some experience of reading the Gulag Archipelago, right, his great literary experiment in which he, he navigated through what it was like to go through that process of being imprisoned, uh, he, he, under, he identified it as conscience. Right, that appeal to conscience, that way in which we grasp the cornerstone of the universe, which is justice, 
Solzhenitsyn said in his famous Templeton address, when he won the Templeton Prize for Freedom, uh, that the primary key to our being or non-being resides in each individual human heart, in the heart's preference for specific good or evil. And all attempts to find a way out of the plight of today's world are fruitless unless we redirect our consciousness in repentance to the creator of all. Without this, no exit will be illumined and we shall seek it in vain. The resources we've set aside for ourselves are too impoverished for the task. We must first recognize the horror perpetrated not by some outside force, not by class or national enemies, but within each of us individually and within every society. This is especially true of a free and highly developed society, for here in particular, we have surely brought everything upon ourselves of our own free will. We ourselves in our daily unthinking selfishness are pulling tight that noose. It's a fascinating, fascinating passage, and it mirrors again so many others. If you've read One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich, you know that, that the main character, Ivan Denisovich Shukov, ends his day, his eponymous day, almost happy. And part of the reason why he's almost happy is he's not quite sure of the purpose for which he's acting, but he knows that there, there has to be something out there. And his interactions with the character Alyosha, the Baptist, who is named, of course, after Dostoevsky's famous character, are really illuminating because Alyosha asks him what he wants freedom for. If you had freedom, Ivan, what would you do with it? And Ivan's not quite sure. Uh, Alyosha's sure he knows that he is living for God. Ivan, not quite sure, but he knows that something is out there, and that's why he's almost happy. It's that grasping out for the ends of freedom and the ends of happiness that are the key uh, to his own future. And of course, we don't know what happens to him. Solzhenitsyn didn't write a sequel to it. Uh, if, if he had been in today's culture, he, of course, would have made many sequels and many remakes, but thank God he was not. But the great thing about Solzhenitsyn is that he speaks to us through his characters and through his direct words to us in the West to seek out life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness in the right order and in the right way. And to that end, I think that uh, Solzhenitsyn needs to be remembered and studied uh, forevermore. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. I apologize for the technical difficulties. Um, I want to say my thanks to, to Mark Meister, the, uh, the director of the Museum of Russian Art, who's unfortunately not able to, uh, to communicate clearly with us, but he's uh, the leader of an institution. I'm very grateful. I've been a, a professor of Russian history here in the Twin Cities for 13 years, and every year I bring students to this magnificent institution to see the the new exhibits and to take place and all the special events. And I'm really grateful for uh, this institution. And uh, I was not asked to, to say this, but this is a difficult time to lead an organization. So if you're thinking about ways to support worthy local institutions, I would put in my uh, vote of support for the, uh, the Museum of Russian Art. I also want to thank Todd Lefko. His um, idea led to this event tonight as the leader of the Russian American Business and Culture Council. I appreciate the, the effort that he's putting into organizing wonderful educational and cultural events to um, enrich a better understanding of how Americans and Russians can connect. I also want to thank uh, Michelle Massey, who works at the museum in organizing uh, public programs. Very grateful for all the work that she puts into supporting these programs behind the scene. And I want to thank Lucian O'Brien as well, providing the technical assistance for uh, for this event. And of course, I want to thank Dave and Jessica. It was a pleasure to listen to your presentations, and I'm so grateful for all the hard work that went into um, to organizing this volume, editing this volume. It's uh, I feel honored to be able to play a very small role in a wonderful tribute to Edward Erickson, who um, uh, contributed in a tremendous way to um, to his students and to a much broader range of readers, especially through the editing of the wonderful abridgment of Gulak Archipelago. 
So before I tell you a little bit about the the chapter that I um, contributed, there seems to be a tradition of uh, recommending a work by Solzhenitsyn. So maybe I'll I'll win some uh, some votes by um, or some appreciation by recommending one of my favorite works, which is rather short, and it's one of his earliest works, Matrona's Home. So these days we um, we all need to be good neighbors, and I think this story. Um, more than many than I can think of shows us how to be a good neighbor. So Matrona sets a good example and uh, Solzhenitsyn creates this magnificent, brilliant little piece of literature that opens our eyes to, to what is possible. So today I'm going to share about the contents of the chapter um, that I contributed for this book. My title of the, ch the chapter that I contributed is The YMCA Press, Russian Orthodoxy and Alexander Solzhenitsyn. So the chapter tells the story of a man named Paul B. Anderson. So he and a small group of American Protestant volunteers patiently learned from Russian Orthodox friends that they made. Anderson was the founder of the YMCA Press, which published the first Russian edition of Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago in Paris, France. These volunteers changed their strategy of service in order to contribute to the flourishing of Russian culture in exile, a culture which supported the priceless contributions of Solzhenitsyn. The establishment, the focus, and the commitment of the YMCA Press helped to amplify the author's distinct message of freedom. Natalia Solzhenitsyn, who was highlighted early, earlier, she praised the work of the YMCA Press during an event in 1982 and her remarks underscored the significance of a very small enterprise which had emerged 66 years earlier. And this is what she stated at that event. This publishing house for all these years has been giving to Russians living in Russia the real bread of life. I really have to testify that the hunger for books is really a much greater hunger than the hunger for food. The greatest help that we can receive is precisely the kind of help that was given to us by Paul Anderson. Now, a number of writers have briefly highlighted the publisher of her husband's Gulag Archipelago, but relatively few works have explored the origin and the development of this very significant publishing organization. So first I'd like to take a look at the roots of the YMCA Press, what came before it, what prepared the way. The American Young Men's Christian Association, the well-known YMCA, or the Y, began their work in Russia in 1900, well before the revolution. They developed a variety of educational, religious, and athletic programs. The primary goal was to support the intellectual, the spiritual, and physical development of young men. YMCA leaders began their work by establishing a public gymnasium, organizing Bible study groups, and providing direction to a Christian student movement. During the First World War, many Y workers organized assistance for soldiers and prisoners of war in Russia. After the emigration of a number of Russians to Western Europe after the revolution, they assisted the new Russian Christian student movement, the St. Sergius Theological Academy in Paris, and the YMCA Press. And during these years, Y leaders such as Paul B. Anderson developed partnerships with a number of outstanding Orthodox leaders. And these included Sergei Bulgakov, Nikolai Berdyaev, George Florovsky, and many others. Many outstanding Russian intellectuals of the early 20th century were um, encouraged and developed friendships with these YMCA leaders. So in this way, the YMCA contributed to the preservation the enrichment and the expansion of Russian Orthodox faith and culture, especially through its support of the emigre student movement, the publishing house and the theological academy, the YMCA played a major role in preserving an important part of pre-revolutionary Russian culture in Western Europe during the Soviet period. The relationship of the YMCA with Orthodox leaders provides a rare example of fruitful interconfessional cooperation by Protestant and Orthodox Christians. And this was also an extraordinary period of dynamic 
interaction between American and Russian cultures. So what was the origin of the YMCA press itself? During the First World War, the American branch of the global YMCA began to produce practical textbooks and Protestant writings for Russian readers. However, the focus of the YMCA's publishing efforts later turned to religious literature for Russian emigres living in Western and Central Europe. The full lifespan of the press included six significant leaders. Before World War II, Julius Hecker, Paul B. Anderson, and Nikolai Berdyaev were the key leaders. And after the war, Donald Lowry, Ivan Morozov, and Nikita Struve led the way. Anderson established the organizational foundation for the YMCA press as an established organization, while the Russian philosopher Nikolai Berdyaev set the intellectual foundation. The Russian publishing effort through the press began during the First World War due to the work of Julius Hecker. He began the Russian publishing program while he was working with prisoners of war from Russia who were held in Austria from 1915 to 1917. So he was helping to organize literacy classes to, for soldiers from a peasant background and created a series of primary readers which included selections from classic Russian literature. In 1922, the leaders of the YMCA's Russian work reestablished the publishing program. They moved into some new directions and they used the funds which had been allocated for Hecker's project and they were able to purchase a printing plant in Prague, um, Czechoslovakia. So during this time, Paul B. Anderson worked closely with the press since he was the director of the Russian Correspondence School in Berlin. The YMCA provided correspondence courses, primarily vocational training courses for Russian uh, emigres around the world. And during this time, Anderson began to serve as the director of publishing for the Russian work as well. So Paul B. Anderson was someone who served the Russian people from his first trip to Russia in 1917, and he continued this work until his death in 1985. He grew up not far from here in Iowa. He's a graduate of the University of Iowa, and he had a long-term in-depth involvement in Slavic life. He made an attempt to understand the language and the history and the culture, and throughout his life, he provided leadership for every major aspect of the YMCA's Russian work. So in 1924, after the shift of a number of Russian emigres from Berlin and Prague to Paris due to economic reasons, the YMCA followed um, the group of people that they were trying to serve. And the goals of the YMCA press began to change as well. By this time, Paul B. Anderson had developed a very significant relationship with Nikolai Berdyaev. And just a few words about Berdyaev, he was one of the most important Russian philosophers of the early 20th century. He was a prominent um, thinker in the realms of religious thought, also political thought, and philosophy in general. He was from Kiev, but later lived in St. Petersburg, Moscow, Berlin, and then Paris. So Berdyaev was an Orthodox Christian, but he was very much connected to the culture which surrounded him. He very sharply criticized um, the Orthodox Church, which provided a home for him, but he was not uh, sparing in his criticism of a variety of thoughts and attitudes within the church. He was a prolific author. Even though he was organized in publishing work, he himself was a very prolific author and wrote dozens of books and articles and essays. And throughout his life had a tremendous influence, not just among Russians, but among the French, French thinkers and American thinkers as well. And so as Anderson developed this relationship with Berdyaev, the network expanded, and I've already mentioned Sergei Bulgakov, George Florovsky, two of the most outstanding uh, Russian theologians of the early 20th century. So they began to understand, the YMCA leaders, the intellectual and religious vitality of the Orthodox community. The Russian Orthodox Church no longer enjoyed the financial and political support of the state as they had in the empire, but they seemed to grow given the opportunity for freedom and um, intellectual development. By the time the Second World War broke out, the YMCA Press held the position as the leading publisher of philosophical 
and religious works in the Russian language. Obviously, many of these works were not able to be uh, public in the Soviet Union. So during these years, the American YMCA achieved several things through the press. The press produced a collection of significant theological and philosophical literature, which was widely read. These books did not simply fill library shelves, but they were widely read and passed from hand to hand. Often they were um, short and acceptable, but brilliant in the ideas that they presented. They were widely read among the emigre population, both among um, the clergy and among lay people who were interested in the ideas that were presented. The faculty of the St. Sergius Theological Academy, the only Russian Orthodox institution of higher education during this time, they were able to publish their works with the YMCA press. The press assisted Berdyaev in publishing a journal known in Russian as Put, that is the way. And this was the um, an intellectual journal grounded in Russian orthodoxy. So one of the later editors commented the worth of such literature can be calculated only against the dark background of the state presses of communist Russia that pour out deluges of materialist atheism. By producing Russian Orthodox religious literature, the press was attempting to build character among young people, among the emigres. They were attempting to study contemporary social challenges and preserve what they saw as the best aspects of traditional Russian culture. Now, the YMC never gained acceptance among the most conservative of the Orthodox hierarchs, but by World War II, the press had received the blessing of the Orthodox clergy throughout, um, throughout Europe. By 1939, the press had published a total of 274 titles. So in 15 years, 275 books. And this is really a remarkable contribution for a very small and not heavily supported um, program. Now, after the war, the influence continued. After the war, the press was able to establish contact with the new Moscow Patriarch, Alexei. And after the war, as you may know, the condition of the um, Orthodox Church improved to a degree, at least from a legal point of view, or from a administrative point of view, not from a legal point of view. And so they were able to um, have books directed to the recently opened theological academies and seminaries, which were reopened only during World War II. And after the war, the press also expanded its publication beyond theology and philosophy to literature. So they began to publish, for example, the complete works of Fyodor Dostoevsky, which was not widely available except among scholars in the Soviet Union at that time. They also began to publish editions of the works of Anna Akhmatova, Marina Tsvetaeva, Andrei Platonov, and Vladimir Voinovich, some of the greatest Russian writers of the early 20th century. Now in the 1950s, the American YMCA began to, to disengage. They wanted it to be a, a, uh, a locally supported institution, and Paul B. Anderson worked very carefully to make sure that the press continued its work, but under the sponsorship of the Russian student Christian movement, which had attracted a large, um, a large range of support in Paris and throughout Europe. So Nikita Struve was a, um, a Russian, from a Russian emigre family, but very much uh, settled into life in France. He later became a professor of Russian literature, and he was the editor and the, um, the director of the YMCA Press, who was working during the time of the publication of the works of Alexander Solzhenitsyn. So now I turn to perhaps the, the part of the chapter which is most directly connected to Alexander Solzhenitsyn, but I think you'll see that the preliminary comments show how the connection between Solzhenitsyn and this very small publishing company in, um, in Paris, how they made that connection. So the press really went from being an, a little known organization to a widely known organization in the 1960s and 70s because of the publication of the works of Solzhenitsyn. So they began to publish works and this eventually led to the publication of a 20 volume set of his collected works. So they published the first full length uh, Russian version of Cancer Ward, which I should add is also a remarkable work. It's uh, perhaps more accessible than some of his other 
uh, works. And in a uh, time of a health crisis, here we have a example of um, looking at the ways um, that people struggle with difficulties and the way they respond to each other. It's truly a brilliant work, which is uh, just as relevant today as it was when it was uh, published. So the staff of the YMCA Press had recognized that Alexander Solzhenitsyn's voice echoed the voices of Nikolai Berdyaev and many other earlier um, Russian writers that they had been publishing. So like them, Solzhenitsyn was writing for, on many themes for a broad contemporary audience, but he's writing from an Orthodox Christian viewpoint, even if it's not immediately obvious. So throughout his works, he emphasized the fundamental goodness, the essential goodness of creation, the dignity of every person, the human tendency to forget God, and the hope of reconciliation between God and man and among all things, among all people. So he was also a prophet, as many have pointed out, and he was one to prophetically lament and challenge the attitudes and behaviors of church hierarchs. Simply because he had become an Orthodox believer during his time in captivity, he did not um, uncritically um, support the leaders of his church. He honestly spoke out when he felt that they were not doing what, they, what their role had called them to do. So the publication of the Gulag Archipelago was a literary bombshell. It really shook the world in many ways on December 28th, 1973. And this was the first time that the press received worldwide attention. It was, you know, highlighted many major uh, news sources and many people began to ask, what is this YMCA press? Where did it come from? And in a few weeks, 50,000 copies of this book were sold very quickly. This was a, a record in Russian emigre publishing. So in on April 9th, 1975, Alexander Solzhenitsyn was able to visit the office of the YMCA Press in Paris. And at this meeting, Nikita Struve was there as the director, but also the earlier director, Paul B. Anderson, was present at that meeting. And when Solzhenitsyn first met Anderson, he exclaimed, Atiets Inki, that is, the father of the YMCA Press. He was very pleased to have this chance to, to meet him face to face. And of course, uh, Paul Anderson was deeply grateful for the chance to interact directly with this uh, monumental Russian author. So they had a, an engaging conversation. Um, the author was very interested to hear about Anderson's uh, brief imprisonment back in 1918. And they talked about opportunities for research in the United States and had, a, had many, um, um, many shared interests, to say the least. So on that day, Solzhenitsyn gave Anderson a book with an inscription, which I think says a great deal. To Paul Anderson with thanks and respect, remembering how much he has done for Russian culture. There's a, a wonderful book of memoirs written by Solzhenitsyn entitled The Oak and the Calf. And in this book, Solzhenitsyn referred to all of his publishers as selfless. And that's quite a compliment. Of course, it was not a simple thing to be Solzhenitsyn's uh, publisher. I'll spare you all the details there. But in this uh, work, Solzhenitsyn describes how he was able to build the connections and build the trust with Nikita Struve that led to the publication of these works. And this is also discussed in the, the later memoir, Invisible Allies, which is also uh, worth reading. So through publishing the writings of Nikolai Berdyaev and Sergei Bulgakov, they provided the YMCA Press provided inspiration for Solzhenitsyn to continue their critique of, of atheism. The, um, the press obviously supported the publication of Dostoevsky, and Dostoevsky was a, a dominant influence on the thinking and the writing of Solzhenitsyn, but he was also significantly influenced by these early 20th century emigre writers. So in conclusion, let me say that the, um, this account of the YMCA Press, Alexander Solzhenitsyn's Paris publisher, amplifies one of the author's foundational themes, freedom. The writer and the YMCA Press both champion freedom of thought, freedom of the soul, and freedom of publication. Solzhenitsyn passed away not long ago in 2008, and his ally in, in Paris, Nikita Struve, followed in 2016. 
and it's fitting that they will be remembered together along with colleagues of the YMCA Press um, in active ways in Moscow at the Alexander Solzhenitsyn House of Russia Abroad, Dom Ruskova Zaurubezhia. So this is an organization that was founded in 1995 in Moscow by the Solzhenitsyn Foundation, the YMCA Press, and the city of Moscow. And this is really a remarkable institution. It continues to support thoughtful, critical reflection on culture, on philosophy, on faith, on art through its newly expanded museum. The museum was uh, recently opened. I'm looking forward to visiting the next time I have a chance to, to be in Russia. Who knows when that will be? They also have a, an amazing um, archival collection, which was founded due to the efforts of Alexander Solzhenitsyn to collect um, documents, primary source documents of accounts of life in the Gulag and other experiences um, in Russia. And there's a, an amazing library they produce, or they coordinate exhibitions, lectures, and conferences today. So thank you for your attention, and I look forward to uh, a time for a few questions. So I'd be glad for questions for, for me or for uh, my colleagues, David or Jessica. Anyone has any questions, you're welcome to put them in the chat or speak them out loud. Do I? So while you're thinking, perhaps I'll uh, hold up a visual aid. So here's the work that we've been discussing, Solzhenitsyn and American Culture, the Russian Soul in the West. And it's published by the University of Notre Dame Press. It includes over 20 chapters looking at the influence of Alexander Solzhenitsyn as a writer, as a, an, um, as a, an artistic figure, and as a political figure, and how other Russian um, uh, cultural leaders have had a broad influence in America. So I think it's a, it's a rich and a, an engaging work, and I think, uh, um, think it would be a, a, a great read for a, a long winter evening, perhaps. <laughs> That was a good Lucian plug. Has put the, uh, has put the link in the chat bar too for everybody, so. Great. Well, I see that we're nearing. Looks like we have a question from Paula in the chat. Um, given your knowledge and, and it doesn't, Paula, you can specify if you wanted this to go to any specific presenter, but I'll read it now. Given your knowledge of his thought, what do you think Solzhenitsyn would think about the contemporary situations in both the U.S. and Russia? Historian, do you want to start? Or? <laughs> so, you know, I think a lot of the ideas that have been shared already would be, you know, the ideas that I think he would say that we should always, you know, value truth regardless of what we want to be true, we need to speak about what is true, and we should always uh, be known for saying what corresponds with reality, even if it's not something that we enjoy or are glad to report. So I think truth is something that he stood up for. I also uh, deeply appreciate his, um, his value of the dignity of every human being, not just those in the majority, but those in the minority. I was you know, that always stood out to me as I read throughout the works. You know, he obviously had people that um, he respected and agreed with that were represented in his works, but he gave everyone an opportunity um, to speak. Had everyone had a chance to to share their voice. And even if we even if we felt that Solzhenitsyn was not speaking with approval, he was speaking with you know respect for the dignity of different um, national groups, different political views. You know, as long as those people were, you know, uh, respecting the rights of people and not, uh, you know, not uh, carrying out violence. So, so maybe I'll, uh, I could say other things, but let me turn it over to my colleagues. Well, so David mentioned that actually part of his second volume of his memoir, From Living Over Here in America, has just been published by Notre Dame. And National Review Online had a few excerpts from that that I think are worth reading that kind of respond to this question. 
uh, one of which is a letter to President Reagan, which he refused to go to the White House. And the reason he refused to go to the White House is because the invitation came not to have conversations, but to be a symbolic representation of a, a Russian nationalist. And he refused on those terms. He said, I'm not a nationalist. I'm a patriot, which means I also respect the patriotism of other countries. I do not believe my country is better than others, and I don't define myself by my country. And I think all of those are things to remember, especially in our political moment, uh, where there is a lot of tendency towards nationalism and a confusion between nationalism and patriotism. And so I think reading Social Nietzsche is good at clarifying and distinguishing between those two things. Yeah, it's uh, it's hard to say what he. I mean, he's now been dead for for over a decade, so it's hard to say. But I mean, one thing that uh, he was sort of given grief about during his life was that he was a kind of moderate supporter of Vladimir Putin, um, and he thought that he was uh, he was an authoritarian but not a totalitarian. Um, but he part of the reason why he supported him was he believed that Putin had at least brought a sense of sort of uh, national identity and a kind of patriotism back, even if he, he even if he had problems. Um, Solzhenitsyn was very bothered by the end of the Cold War, in which uh, he felt that uh, you know much of the country's resources were divvied up and were taken up by gangsters who had previously been serving the Soviet Union, but now in their own sort of private private lives. So he had kind of. He had kind of, you know, controversial opinions about about those sorts of things. Even then, it's hard to say what he would say now about uh, about the situation in Russia. But he was uh, he was a great defender of 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 his own nation, and he believed that you had to love your nation. And many of his great poems uh, that he he wrote deal with that love of his nation. He couldn't think of himself as an American, and he did he did return obviously when when it was uh, possible to do so. Thankfully, he is now honored in certain ways in the high school curriculum. Uh, he, he is read by, uh, by Russian high school students. So I, I have one more thought, but uh, Lucian, are there any other questions by any chance? Yes, yeah, as a matter of fact, we have one more from uh, Todd Lefko himself here. Um, which I'll read. So many of the messages of Solzhenitsyn remain as basic human questions. Why do you think he is seen as being so anti-American? He was not. Uh, he was not a yes man to to the Americans. You know, I emphasize that in some of his addresses in the '70s, he actually talked very in very high praise of of the American people and of our constitution and even in certain ways of the way that our government worked. But he was also very critical um, in that 1978 Harvard address, a world split apart. He said, he distinguished, he said, you know, the yes man is your enemy. Um, and he was not a yes man. He said that your friend tells you the truth and the truth is often bitter. And that's why he can say things in that address, uh, such as, well, when people ask me, do I want Russia to be modeled on the United States? I honestly have to say no. Uh, but that was not, I think, an anti-American statement. It was, it was a criticism of certain of those tendencies, some of which uh, you know, I outlined in my talk. Um, but what's interesting is that in the first volume of memoirs, uh, Between Two Millstones, the first book, um, he actually talked about the responses that he got uh, to that address in which he said those hard truths. And some of the ones were, were from people who were, were very outraged, but he said he got letters from ordinary people all over America who said, you've identified a problem that, that, that we see as well. So he wasn't, he wasn't being anti-American so much as, as a, a true friend who criticized what was uh, false about, uh, about America's direction, false to, to itself. I think he was also really good at offending both sides of things. <laughs> so, you know, uh, David has mentioned before that he calls himself a liberal conservative, which means there are plenty of liberals that hate him and there's plenty of conservatives that hate him and therefore he's getting 
attack from both angles. And I think that's one of the reasons that he appears to be anti-American, um, is Americans find things to kind of cherry pick out of him and say, this is what Solzhenitsyn stands for, you know, I'm gonna throw it out. Uh, Solzhenitsyn just doesn't fit into American political categories in that way, and it's a false distinction to put him in one of those categories. Um, so we don't really know where to place him sometimes, and I, I think that's one of the reasons he also gets attacked. Um, one one more thought on why he's anti-American. Like David said, he attacks some of those things that I think we falsely construed as our identity, right? So this identity that we have so many choices before us, we are so full of material blessings. Solzhenitsyn didn't think those were the great goods of Americanism. That actually our virtues is what he respected, the virtues that he found in the founding, the virtues of community, the virtues he found in his neighbors in Vermont. And he respected those virtues, but they weren't what people were uplifting. And so when he attacked consumerism and materialism and saw that as spiritual poverty, Americans rejected that because they felt like it was an attack on their identity, on their aspects of being American. And it was just a false sense of what it means to be an American that was under attack. You know, it's one of the comments is that he was an equal opportunity offender, truth teller, and I think that's correct. And uh, I think that's what what we read Solzhenitsyn for. I think uh, Matthew brought this up as well, is that he is willing to both criticize but also give give the good lines to all sorts of figures, and that's that's true. Uh, you know, I think Matthew, you were you were mentioning the oak and the calf, which is his his sort of autobiographical story of how he came to publish and how he eventually came to, to, be, uh, to be expelled from the Soviet Union. And that's a marvelous book for anybody who wants to, wants to read. He has a, just a wonderful ability to capture figures in a few lines uh, and also to acknowledge the, 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 uh, the ambiguities in each human heart. And I think that's one of his great gifts to us. It looks like we've run over time, so I don't want to be holding more people up and I don't see questions. I wasn't sure if Mark or Todd were going to jump in at the end. Or Lucian, is it now your responsibility? <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah, it seems um, if, if Mark and Todd um, are, are not here to close it up, I just wanted to thank everybody for coming on, on the behalf of the museum and the business council and we hope you see you at other events and we hope you um will look into the book if you found this interesting so thanks a lot i'll end it here thank you very much this is a great opportunity to do cool. this